Welcome to Vice and Easy, your podcast for all things Miami Vice, with your host, Marina. Welcome back to Vice and Easy. Now, this week we are covering an incredibly iconic episode. Yes, we are covering Viking Bikers from Hell. This is a very popular episode, and I can tell you exactly why. There are a lot of things going on this episode. There are a lot of muscles. There are a lot of great outfits. There's a lot of cheesiness. And uh, (laughs) there's just a whole lot going on this episode. So come on in and join me, Marina, for a very interesting ride for about the next 45 minutes as we break down Season 3, Episode 22, Viking Bikers from Hell. Here is a synopsis from IMDb. A member of a violent gang is accidentally killed during a drug sting by Crockett. The other members of his biker gang avenge his death by killing everybody that may have been a part of it until they find the wire. As we open this episode, first of all, we have a son and a statue. I'm assuming it's going to be a Norse Viking statue with the title of this episode. I did not look into it. Then we have our... Very hunky biker, former Captain America, Reb Brown, step off a bus that is later revealed to be a prison bus. I do not know how this works. I know with jail, because I know this from Twin Towers in downtown Los Angeles, they kind of just let you on your way. For jail, do they actually drop you off or do they just let you on your way and someone picks you up? I thought they just let you on your way and somebody picked you up to drop them off right where his friends are meeting him at this like industrial wasteland park with flaming barrels. <laughs> Quite interesting. Furthermore, look at the smoke whipping around these actors. I am very curious how they got this shot because it looks as if they're spinning around and around and around. The smoke is while they're standing still. So as our hunky Reb gets off the bus in a button-down white shirt, gets to see some old friends. Now let's set the mood here. We have Valhalla by Chris Barr playing in the background. Number one. Then we got some Emmy winning dialogue as he catches up with his old friends. Sure don't look like no scooter trash, Reb. I must have been rehabilitated. Look good, Reb. They feed you well. Strong always eat well. When's the funeral? Tomorrow, 10 (laughs) o'clock. That sound after he says the strong always eat well is him just ripping off his short sleeve button up white t-shirt, getting tossed his old cut or his old vest. And so as they're catching up, you know, this funeral is tomorrow. He gets introduced to Charlie, who I guess has kind of taken his place in the gang. And (laughs) when he asks where his scooter is, again, I don't know why they're using scooter instead of bike, I would offend someone if I was like, oh, where's your scooter? Like, scooters to me are like the Lime or the Bird scooters. Not an actual motorcycle. Oh my god, this is so funny. And so they basically say he can ride with Charlie, or, I hate saying this, but ride bitch seat with Charlie. Uh, To that response, he asks for his piece, gets it, shoots Charlie. (laughs) takes his bike one member is laughing the other is horrified like he was a really nice guy you would have liked him but like so this is the guy we're introduced to right off the bat the strong always eat well ripping off his shirt and killing somebody because he doesn't want to ride on his back maybe you should have just taken the bus that dropped you off here taken that somewhere else maybe you could have uh had your prison bus drop you off at a better position but it's basically with that we end the cold open then after the intro we are opening on the funeral we see gina in a limo or just a car with tinted windows taking photos we also see swatek taking photos and we see what looks like some big wigs at the funeral we see a lot of very interesting inappropriate in my opinion this is me being a little bit of like you know old school 
little inappropriate looks for a funeral if I say so, say so myself. So as the vice squad is taking pictures of the guests at the funeral, Croc and Tubbs are leaving the funeral. I don't know if they actually were inside or they're just hanging around, but turns out they, uh, they played a role in this funeral in this next clip. Sort of weird being at a funeral we caused. It's a street shooting, Rico. Your straight garden variety street shooting. In which one Sonny Burnett takes out Edward the Wire Constantine and splits the scene. That's because there were civilians coming onto the street, pal. What was I gonna do? It was a righteous shoot, man. It would have gone down as justifiable homicide. My cover was compromised, not to mention my life. So if I get lucky and the wire doesn't kill me, then I'm pushing paper in some downtown office. And that is an alternative that is unacceptable, my friend. Okay, that's a little bit wild. Basically, he said the quiet part out loud. Whew. So we now see bikers, the three bikers we saw, the guy who shot the new guy to get it. <laughs> I want to say Toad, and I forget the other one's name. They're also taking pictures of Crockett and Tubbs walking out of this funeral. And this Jan Hummer song is a little familiar. You'll hear it kind of played again and again. Let me see if I have a clip. Okay, never mind. I am so sorry. I do not. <laughs> but you'll hear it again. I, th- I swear I do have a clip of it. It um, kind of reminisces to at the end of the Golden Triangle. And I want to say fill the shill. Um, but let's get to technology. We have a video will from The Wire in this next clip. I, Edward Constantine. How many people even knew my real name, huh? Being of sound mind and body, do hereby bequeath all my worldly possessions to my sister Victoria Elizabeth Constantine. Reb, you out there, dude. You gotta take care of her. Make sure she gets everything, all right? All right, a few notes I just want to get out of the way. Number one is that Peter Sarsgaard. Because that looks just like him. The eyes, the face. He is not credited. No one is credited as being Edward Constantine, despite him having multiple lines in this episode. Even, yes, he's on film, but he still had to speak those lines, still had to... The writer's strike just ended, but we're still talking about Faye Paranac... Faye Par... Faye Pay... Oh, my God. Fair Pay and... This is it, where he's not being credited. I hope he got paid. Peter Sarsgaard, I hope he got paid for that. So that is my point number one. Point number two is, please keep in mind, Reb is watching this video as he is speaking to Reb from beyond the grave to take care of his sister. Keep that in mind. Now, Crockett and Tubbs, all of Ice, back at OCB, kind of going over pictures. They want a little bit more information, and there's one woman they can't really figure out who it is. Very pretty young woman. Uh, I want to say around like mid 30s, but no one recognizes her. So she doesn't have any criminal leanings, unlike the rest of them. <laughs> so they go on a guy who they have leverage on and try to get a little bit more info from him. Because I'll have to take you in for that drug test like the last time. Just look on the bright side of things. Pro violation, give you plenty of time to get rid of that nasty post nasal drip. You guys are supposed to have a court order. My customers value their privacy. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> it was for the guy's sister. No, oh, thank you very much. Now, see, that wasn't so painful, was it? Now, keep in mind when he says clients, he seems to be the head of a fancy hand wash. Hand car wash? Hand wash car wash? A lot of washes in that. Basically, where they wash your hand by car and they wipe it down with the rags. I don't really enjoy those. I'd much rather do it myself for five, six dollars than pay thirty five dollars for someone to do an inadequate job when I could just, you know, do it myself for basically the same amount of time and just do a better job. I think that's it too. It's just I've never, I've never had a good experience at one of those. They've all been ripoffs. So maybe to launder money for my criminal enterprise, I would actually make a really good quality hand car wash. That would be, if I open a business like that, you know I've gone on the dark side. (laughs) But I also just love washing my car when I do. You know, I just really enjoy that bond, that bonding moment with your car. (sighs) So now we have a little bit more information. We know that that mysterious woman that nobody could identify at OCB is the wire sister. Furthermore, we as audience know that Reb 
has been tasked with making sure she gets everything and taking care of her per the Wire's last will and testament that he just watched. Also, we know he's a little bit crazy, so let's all see how that plays out. What every woman who's alone working in her work love space wants to see three biker men show up at her door, not intimidating at all, especially because she knows that her brother was working with his biker gang. So I'm sure that's a lot of fun for her. <laughs> Reb, however, shoots the other two guys away and goes into her loft. Again, uninvited. Let's keep that in mind. I would be <laughs> I would be grabbing a knife if I were her, but she's a little bit more uh trusting than I am. Also because her brother was such a big wig, I guess she knows that she has like some kind of protection and lore in that. But uh however he wants to give her in- her inheritance. She tells him to pound sand in this next clip. The wire was my best friend. He was a great man. My brother was a criminal. Maybe he told you about me, Rev. Look, I have no interest in ever knowing any of my brother's friends. You come from a world I wish never existed. Well, you don't understand. I never will. I have to give you your inheritance. I don't want my inheritance. I don't want anything from his world. I took an oath. My loyalty is honor. You're just as crazy as he was. I just wish you'd get the hell out of here, please. Please. Well, she's completely justified because in this next scene, we see the three bikers outside of a door. And we see one biker, the biker with the headband, loading up a crossbow while the other two bikers, one with like a little weird bouquet of flowers that it was clearly picked from somebody's garden with Reb standing at the door. I really do like the door knocker, that it's like a solid silver ring door knocker. I do really like that. However, uh, this is obviously quite unseemly. And we see why Victoria is justified as they knock on the door with a delivery for Salazar. And yes, the voice is way deeper than mine. So you could imagine how weird and unsettling this must be. Let's hear. It's for Mr. Salazar. What is this, a joke? Yeah, on you. Well, the guy with the crossbow has a really good aim. To be fair, he wasn't that far away. And as they make their way into the house, there is a gentleman that we saw at the funeral. He was the one that I have a photo of in the gallery, which, reminder, you can find the gallery for each and every episode of Vice and Easy in the description notes. It is really fun to listen along and then to look at the pictures I'm talking about. It just kind of gives you a, a nice 360 degree experience as opposed to just, you know, like a flat experience just with my voice. Um, I will say, I do want to give compliments to this episode where compliments are due. I really do like the direction and the cinematography for a lot of these scenes. So this scene where they're trying to figure out where the Krugerrands, these are like, I was like, are these doubloons? I didn't hear Krugerrands. I was like, oh, they're like South African, old school South African currency that I guess belong to the wire. So they're going after this bigwig who is clearing the hot tub with two girls. He's definitely got money. As Reb is kind of drowning him, we get an overhead aerial shot, which I really like because, surprise, surprise, when Reb drowns and killed this guy in front of his biker friends and in front of the two ladies who are just there, speechless and scared. I don't know what I'd do in that situation either. When he's drowning him, it's overhead. And then when Vice comes on the scene, it's also an overhead shot. So I really like this. But as one of the bikers goes inside to, I want to say it looks like his media console. I wasn't listening, sorry. <laughs> to get these doubloons, these Kruger Reds. And like, the coins are so big. It's just very comical. I was like, oh, he's just off to avenge his fallen leprechaun with this gold coin. <laughs> Too funny. Uh, but they end up leaving with the Krugerrands and one less person to worry about. 
Oh, man. Now, at this time, Crockett and Tubbs go pay a visit to Victoria, the wire sister, to try to get a little bit more information out of her. Again, she just had to deal with the three, quote, gorillas. She's, you know, now she's like, what are you two doing here? And again, she says that she's been not a part of her brother's other life. Like, she just knew him as a good guy, and she doesn't want to be associated with that world. And they believe her. Crockett leaves his business card for her to call when she feels like it. I really do like her live work loft. Um, I think that I already mentioned this, the metal chair shaped like men. Super cool. I was like gawking at that the whole episode. And I really like the sketch that she's starting on the back wall of her loft. Just really cool. I really like that. And she uh, has like a very chill artist vibe to her as well. Just like very calm energy. Lots of great robes. Yes, that is always like the the tell of a great artist. It's a great robe. Now let's cut to a familiar character, Izzy. I don't really see him smoking a lot, but he is smoking while singing. And it's he's performing for a bunch of senior citizens sitting on the benches, one of whom is reading a book and could give zero Fs about him, which is even more hilarious. But look at how low energy he is in this performance. And you can understand why the crowd could not be bothered. This way. Besame mucho. Kiss me and kiss me again. You know what Iikami said about that? Kisses are a better fate than wisdom. How many people here are from out of town? Where are you from, huh? Down to Eres. Boca Raton. Oh, man. But the real reason that we're focused on Izzy is that Izzy is going to be Izzy. Now, we have the woman reading the book who does not give two Fs about him. That's what he's trying to do crowd work with. And you just hear the 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 feedback on the microphone. <laughs> she could not care. However, Izzy is paid a visit by Reb. It doesn't take too long for Izzy to start talking. Hey, Reb. Hey, glad to hear you're out on parole, man. I'm sorry to hear about the wire. Hey, listen, anything you want, man, anything you want. You want my car? It's chopped and channeled. There you go. It's parked right out in front out there. Okay, anything you want. You want a woman? Huh? Like, would be good karma for you. Shut up. Come here. Oh, Izzy, I'm also very curious. I think those meant to be two separate thoughts. I'll get you a woman. And another thought, this will be good karma for you. Keep that karma theme in mind because it does come back later on this episode. Now, Izzy being Izzy, he tries to use the mic stand as like a weapon. But keep in mind that Reb is like three times his size. So Izzy's going to be a snitch and he's going to snitch real easily. Brunier. Speak. Oh, that's uh, Cooper and Burnett, that local pond scum, you know, it's real lightweight. I didn't ask for your opinion. You're still a worm, Izzy. Thank you. Oh, yep, Izzy, I never change. Now Crockett and Tubbs pull up in the Testarossa in front of a gorgeous building, by the way. Looks to be like a condo or an apartment building. When they speak with the doorman, doorman alerts him that he heard screams coming from room 1201. Tubbs responds back, we'll take the 11th floor. I don't, I didn't get the joke, but let's continue on. As Crockett and Tubbs get up to the room, get through the door, they're walking through the apartment, kind of scouring, looking around each and every corner with their guns drawn. Must say, I do love the decor. It's very minimal white 80s decor. I do see some gold kind of sculpture paintings on the wall. Got some beautiful pillars. And on one of those pillars is a body wrapped in a sheet, bleeding out through the chest next to a telescope. As he's duct taped around the pillar as well. So what I did laugh extra hard at this. That's my caption. <laughs> Just... Like, they mummified him. I'm sorry. Like, that's... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Death shouldn't be funny, but it kind of is in this instant. So, now, back at OCB, they have the pictures of the five guys so far that have been killed. Not only that, they were photographed at the funeral. 
Pena, Salazar, Mueller, Sutton, and Vallariano. Hmm. What do all these guys have in common? Got to be a connection here. Yeah, there is. They're all very bad boys. Constantine's sister mentioned his business associates. Have we got anything on the wire social habits? Wait a minute. Didn't he use the violators for security? Biker gang? Yeah. He's got Einstein running point for him. Oh, yeah, Cragen. Jack Cragen. Who's that? Oh, <laughs> this guy is a beauty. You'll really like him. I want to introduce you to him. He's bright, articulate, funny. <laughs> you could definitely hear the sarcasm in Sunny's voice. Now we go to what is supposed to be a biker bar that looks like a suburban white woman's basement. And I know it's the 80s and that neon and glass blocks were all the rage. But even when they get down to the basement, they see this like beautiful lamp. This guy next to the jukebox, like it looks like it's like a makeshift bar to set, which I understand. But it does not at all feel like any sort of biker bar to me. Not the decor. I can see coupe glasses. Like, this isn't a dive bar. I was expecting, like, legit biker dive bar. This looks like a, a basement for a person who likes to entertain. With pink neon lights. So it's just, it really took me out of the scene. But you know what brought me back into the scene? A baby-faced Kim Coates. You might not recognize the name. He is a Canadian actor, but he was also on Sons of Anarchy. He is really salty with Crockett, and we love to see it. I can smell you all the way outside. Think it'd be better if I bit your nose off? <laughs> I love it when you talk that way. It makes me so hot. Shut up. Okay, I do love this because they're trying to make it a biker bar by playing George Thorogood in the background. Yes, of course, this episode was going to at least have one George Thorogood song. But then he gets even saltier as Crockett holds him up against the wall and bangs his head into a speaker. Now we're going to play Name the Wacko. Come on. I can do this all day, every day. Who is it? Give me a name. Your mama. <laughs> well, he finally does speak up and he mentions the list. The list is the eight dealers that The Wire worked with before his death. So someone, this being Reb, is going by the list, taking them out one by one. We get an idea of who the next one is. We go back, a beautiful daytime scene of what looks to be like a very nice hotel that is constructed like, um, oh my God, what's that term? It's not a sphere, but when a sphere is long and round, I just talked about this. Oh my God, a cylinder. It is a cylinder. Thank you. A cylindrically shaped hotel with glass and at the bottom. It's right on the water. They're having a little birthday party for him. He has this beautiful cake with white and blue frosting, all his friends are about to sing happy birthday when the bikers pull up at this park while a couple is on a date eating a bucket of chicken, which to be fair, who among us has not had fast food chicken in their car? They also have a very sassy retort for when the couple, the woman specifically, questions who they are. Oh, folks. Who the hell do you think you are? Park Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> they do get them out of the way, not before the girlfriend reprimands her boyfriend for not taking on these massive bikers who are clearly armed, as they just want them to get out of the way. It turns out they want to set up shop so Reb can snipe the birthday boy, as Heaven by Simply Red is playing in the background. So the birthday boy gets shot in the back of the head as the crowd is singing happy birthday to him and just goes head first into his birthday cake. And I don't see anybody screaming or flinching or running away. They didn't even hear the shot because it's probably a silencer as well. So maybe they just thought he passed out. 
I don't know. I think I'd freak out a bit in that situation. But uh, Crockett and Tubbs are more frustrated. They really want to get to the bottom of this and get to know more about this guy, about Reb. They go visit his old prison psychiatrist who has quite interesting things to say. (laughs) He is not censored at all. Incapable of emotion or regard for human life, a finely tuned machine, eager to destroy everybody and everything in his path. Make him sound like a robot. A robot? My mistake. The man is crazy. He's the devil incarnate. He makes Manson look like Mr. Rogers. (coughs) He seemed to have formed an extraordinary bond with Edward Constantine. You know, like Hitler and Himmler. I mean the late Edward Constantine. And now he feels he must avenge his friend's death. Yeah. By snuffing everyone on the list until he gets the right one. Well, in his mind, it makes perfect sense. Process of elimination, in the truest sense of the term. Also, when he was coughing, he's coughing and smoking a cigarette inside, and I believe that ceramic white object is his ashtray. A lot of smoking in this episode. I thought that's the whole reason that Crockett quit, or maybe Don Johnson quit in real life. Uh, I keep getting conflicting timelines on that. Maybe I should just have a Crockett smoking episode. <laughs> but yeah, Big Tobacco is definitely backing this episode because we had Izzy smoking and singing, and then this guy's smoking in his office. <laughs> oh, man. So they're getting a little bit more backup. He feels they now they know that he is definitely avenging his friend's death, and he will stop and nothing to do so. And he will keep going over the list and killing dealers. So the other two bikers are having this really weird, lame party. It's just them and two girls. And they're kind of like, not hooking up because everyone's still dressed, but like feeling on these girls, which am I just I don't even want to get into it, but I still remember one of my sorority sisters was sitting next to her sister at this, like, the local pub we used to go to. But it was, you know, people would dance and grind on each other. And I remember she was talking to a guy and her sister was talking to a guy and the sisters are sitting next to each other and they both start making out with these random guys. And I'm like, that's kind of gross. I don't know why I'm being so judgy, but, like, just to be in that close proximity to your sister kind of icky this is i don't even know where this comes from but that just kind of reminded me of this party and i will say i really love the girl's sparkly dark green dress i used to have an eyeshadow color like that wears a black base with the green sparkles oh but as reb interrupts the party one of the girls starts rubbing all over him reb thinks he's definitely not one of the guys in this respect and <laughs> gets super harsh with her in this next clip. These ladies have plenty to go around. <laughs> I don't swim in dirty water. What's that supposed to mean? Have the trash out at 11. We're riding tonight. Oh my God. Oh, that is a burn. That was way harsh, Ty. Oh, so after that, (laughs) right, trash is out because we're going to ride 11. They start fighting. However, we now cut and we're going to Breakwater. Breakwater is the cute kind of old school hotel. This is the live work loft where Victoria, the wire sister, lives. So they got an eye on hers. White Tech calls in on the walkie talkie or on the radio that she's there alone. However, at the same time, Tubbs is outside of another dealer's house, kind of keeping watch. However, right as he's getting the message from Switek, He sees the three bikers walk out as the house blows up behind them. Pulls out his gun, tells them to freeze. Instead, Rebs shoots Tubbs. And we hear Crockett frantically on the line trying to get through to Tubbs. Unfortunately, next time we see Tubbs, it's at the hospital. And we see Crockett and a doctor walking down the halls. Thank God Tubbs is okay. But the doctor puts it thusly that he is incredibly lucky. 
wondering because he's got to be the luckiest patient in this hospital. Another sixteenth of an inch and you would have been in your dress. He's going to be okay, right? Yeah, well, he's fine now, basically. Just got a bad concussion. Oh, man, this is really scary because Tubbs was shot in the head. And thankfully, he's okay, but could have been a lot worse for him. Crockett, however, is really incensed and rightfully so. So at the hospital, Tubbs is kind of coming in and out of it, says that Reb's an animal, he can't be stopped. So now Crockett is even more fervent on getting through to this guy. One more time, I'm going to definitely shout out the cinematography in the direction of this episode. We get a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful shot, I want to believe, of a causeway. I also forget what a causeway is. How what what is a causeway? I will look this up. I'm sorry, don't yell at me. <laughs> I had a feeling something to do with water because I've seen that word in New Orleans. Um and it looks to be like it's the bridge that lifts up. Just because of the grates. It looks like it's um metal. It doesn't look like he's driving on concrete or asphalt. So why don't I just look that up and let me play you the clip? You're too easy of a target. Listen, you yank me in now and we stand to lose Gustafsson. And if he goes underground, I'll be hit the moment he comes up for air. I want him out in the open where I can deal with him. Switek's on Gustafsson. I want you taking the girl. Yeah, we'll tell Switek not to try to take him alone. He wants me and we got a better shot at taking him if we let him come and get me. I'm trying to prevent that. Causeway is a path that is on low ground or water that has either no space or very little space between the actual road itself and the water, whereas a bridge is naturally elevated. So today I learned, even though I learned this months ago, talking about my movie. So, so sorry. So again, Crockett does not want to be put on Victoria watch. He wants to get Gustafson and he wants to make sure that this is it. At that same time, Reb is at Victoria's leaving her the bag of gold coins. Sorry, the Krugerrands, the doubloons, the pot of gold, whatever you want to call it. Oh, man. Again, she tries to rebuff him. And again, he keeps saying, like, I made an oath. I made a promise. I have to make sure that you get this. And he does leave. And she does start to pilfer through the coin bag. Once again, when Zwitek, who's on Victoria Watch, sees Reb leave the building on his bike. He closes his magic book and goes to follow Reb on the motorcycle, follows him all the way down to the clubhouse down at the end of Virginia Key. So now at least they have more information to work with. At the clubhouse, the headband tosses his drink in the air, goes to smell a slice of old pizza, And then ask Reb what his plans are. We're out of this pit. Where are we going? Valhalla. Valhalla. That's nice. Always wanted to go to Europe. (laughs) Oh my God, that made me laugh so hard. Oh, too funny, too funny. And then... Reb gets asked if Victoria, the wire sister, is going to join them. And then Reb says that she doesn't hang around with trash like you. Like, it seems that Reb thinks he's in a completely different realm with the rest of his peers, from the rest of his peers, and that they're on completely different levels when they're not. So you can definitely tell that his mindset is definitely skewed. As you can tell by him thinking that he's so righteous by taking out these drug dealers in a way to avenge his friend and harassing this poor woman into taking inheritance that she doesn't want with dirty money. Ah, but I digress. So now, Vice knows where the clubhouse is located. Metro is already on the way there. Trudy, once Switek called into her so that she'd have a crew there in two minutes, Crockett calls up OCB, Gina answers, wants to know the location as well. She, again, tries to remind him that Castillo doesn't want him out. He yells at her and gets her given the address, and he is on his way down there. Now, when we're down there, we see Metro on the loudspeaker tell the bikers to come out with their hands up. Toad comes out of the clubhouse first. Hands 
above your head. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! We surrender! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! We surrender! We surrender! Don't shoot! in the house now! Oh man, in a surprise to nobody, they're not really surrendering. They end up blowing up Metro's van and firing at the officers involved. As they're firing back, Reb, with some kind of shotgun, blows a giant hole through the door, speeds out on his motorcycle, not his scooter, on his motorcycle, powers down, is able to drive over and jump the cop car, gets onto the road, runs a Jeep off the road, and then almost runs into Crockett, who gets run off the road, knows exactly who it is, and zips around, makes a U-turn, and goes after them. Now, it's at this point, they make a turn into, like, an abandoned marina. There is an ad that I took a screenshot of that it says... Dove men for the soul. I'm really trying to figure it out what it says on there. But that really caught my eye. But it looks to be like an abandoned marina by the port or just like kind of like an industrial port area where they're playing cat and mouse. But I really like the song that's playing. It's called Tightrope by the Damned in the background. Ooh, I really like the use of, dare I say, bells in that song. Like, it does kind of remind me of sounds you'd hear at a circus. I'm trying to say that in, like, an eloquent manner. But <laughs> sounds circusy, you know? Like, it does sound like you are, like, a high-act trapeze act. So this cat and mouse game is going on for a while until I have no idea what his reasoning is. So Reb is up a level yells out Burnett, kicks a metal barrel into him. No idea why he would call it his name first, unless he really wanted to have him freeze and look up while he did it. Then after that, he tries pushing off this big shelf. (laughs) He luckily doesn't hit Crockett. Crockett's stunt stunt double, as we'll see in this episode, needs to get a raise or a bonus because it is wild. Then Reb is able to pin Crockett to the side. It's choking him. It's just then Reb is so intent on choking Crockett slash Burnett. Sonny reaches into his ankle. Sock gets his gun, shoots Reb three times in the stomach. Reb steps back, bleeding, and then high off adrenaline, rushes to the edge of the boat, chokes Crockett again, and pushes him off. Now, I made a gif of them falling down, and I believe it is Crockett's stunt double who hits his head on the side of the boat and then falls into the water. I was like, that is a really scary stunt. That could have gone really bad. However, everyone's okay. I didn't read any news on this. We see Crockett coming out of the water with blood all over him. Remember, Reb's blood. Climbing up a ladder, looking amazing in that white suit, and just exhaling. It's over. Crockett visits Tubbs at the hospital, and he's standing right at the corner of his room. Very, like, American gigolo style, I must say. (laughs) That is what it was, like, kind of reminiscent of. Waiting for Tubbs to wake up. Now, I also want to point out Tubbs's jammies are adorable. Like, he's in, like, a full pajama set at the hospital. He's not in, like, an uncomfy gown or, like, some kind of, like, old t-shirt and boxers. Like, he looks super cute. (laughs) Oh, man. We also have uh, beautiful flowers there as well. And Crockett's really feeling in his feelings. And for a good number of reasons, he almost died. Tubbs almost died because of this guy. For a promise that he thought would bring some kind of realignment or justice to his friend's passing, that he went on this killing spree and hurt innocent people in the process. And the sister, who again, just wanted to live a normal, quiet life far away from her brother, 
she's had to peace out and leave town because of all this. So when Tubbs wakes up, Crockett gets really philosophical with him. You know, it's funny how Dawn makes everything look clean. (laughs) Yeah, but they're out there. Who? The monsters. The freaks. The animals. You think you know the street. And then every once in a while you find a whole new level. (laughs) Then Tubbs asks about why her sister. Crockett says that she's left town. Tubbs, you know, still wants to presume that she's innocent. Crockett has a little bit of doubt. And they get back into the discussion right now. It'd be nice to think that there's some cosmic balance in the universe. There sure isn't any innocence. We've got to be better. Better? (laughs) What's with this better crap? (laughs) You really think we're better? Better shots. Um, that's how the episode ends, question mark? Okay, I, for one, thought I'd have a lot more to say on this episode, but let's break it down, and I'm sure I will not shut up anyway. Let's start with some fashion. Fashion. And a surprise to nobody, Crockett and Tubbs were not even on the best stress list of this episode because it was very hard. I just didn't want to put all the bikers in the wild card. I wanted to give Reb's silver crop top, not the tank top that just the straps go over the nipples because that is a fan favorite. That is also my personal favorite. But just him in Victoria's house with a big belt and like this is a beast of a man. Like there was a reason he was Captain America. I was looking this guy up. I was like, oh, wow, that is a hunky hunky man he's gonna be my best dressed man now gina in that sheer it i'm very curious what material it is i don't want to say it's mesh but it could be could be like a kind of like a thicker kind of mesh in a button-up blue mesh blouse when she's giving crockett the location of the clubhouse at the end of the episode she's gonna be a best dressed woman now i have finally i love including men with my best accessories i know this is more of a recent category Trudy obviously is going to be my best accessories woman or my best accessorized woman at the funeral with the big triangle earrings and the beautiful yellow sunglasses. But back to that quote unquote biker bar that's really just some mother's basement. The biker standing with the little hat and the gloves and the the wrist and the bracelets, everything. He is my best accessories. Now, this one building really caught my eye. So think back to the scene where you can look at the gallery on Imager that you can find in the descriptor notes of each and every episode of Vice and Easy. You can also check out the uh, page on Imager, Vice and Easy Podcast. I want to say there is a typo in there, so it's probably Vice E-A-D-N, A-Z Podcast. (laughs) Now... Oh my God, where was I? Ah, so this beautiful apartment building that I could see in the background, this beautiful building, I didn't know what it was. It's called the uh, Villa Regina or the Via Regina. And the balconies are different colors. So it kind of looks like a rainbow. It's this really beautiful building that you could see. Um, I include a link to it for some fun facts. And it seems like other buildings have kind of taken that inspiration and made more buildings around that around the world. But this building was constructed in 1980. And it was just so unique and so cool to see on the waterfront. I really liked it. That's definitely going to be my best exterior decor. And my best interior decor, this is tough because I really love that basement bar, wink, wink. But I also love the knockers, the door knockers. And I include a picture of Crockett and Tubbs when they're going into the building to check on the guy. To see that, super cool. Now, my wild card 
no surprise, I already gave it away. The super skinny tank tops with the straps covering the nipples. I've seen things. Oh, man. Now let's get to music. I will say I will definitely credit the music department for picking very appropriate songs. We have Valhalla, of course, Viking Heaven by Chris Barr in the opening scene. Then we have Who Do You Love by George Thorogood, obviously at the quote unquote biker bar. Then Heaven by Simply Red. I want to say Simply Red was more recently on episode, or maybe that was Mike and the Mechanics. Kind of the same thing. I know Mike and the Mechanics broke off from Genesis, so and they're Simply Red is also British, so I just always get them confused with one another. And then the end, we have Tightrope Walk by The Damned. All really great songs. However, I have to obviously give it to George Thorogood. Who do you love for this biker episode? How could I not? And like I said earlier, I really enjoy the Jan Hammer music. That like, obviously pulled from different episodes. Like I was saying, Golden Triangle, Part 2. I definitely heard one from... Um, I want to say it was Phil the Shell. And then when I looked it up, Rain was also used at uh, on Milk Run. So lots of very familiar themes. And then some new music as well. Uh, there's actually a big selection of the songs on Marty Castillo's YouTube channel for this episode. So Van H- Jan Hammer really did a lot this episode. I'll definitely give him that. Now, Vice T. I really wanted to have more Vice T for you. So I only have good things to say about Kim Coates. And it's funny, you know how Canadians always have like some connection to a Canadian celebrity because, you know, especially in Toronto, like we'll always be like, oh, I saw so-and-so or, you know, for example, Drake went to the high school next to my middle school. So that's always like our claim to fame is like some friend of a friend of a friend story. So with Kim Coates, um, I've only heard good things about him, but it's actually funny. He came to my boyfriend's middle school class. I want to say it was either how to teach them how to ice skate or how to play hockey because his daughters were enrolled in the same school, which I thought was very funny. I was like, oh, that's so L.A. But he has nothing but fond memories of that. And they said that his daughters are really cool and like very chill and that he it's the first time my boyfriend had ever heard of a place called Saskatoon. (laughs) in Saskatchewan because Kim Coates is from Saskatchewan originally and he does do a lot of really great work within the Canadian theatre community and you know he's been a character actor for years and years and years always hustling always working and when I heard him recently on the podcast he had nothing but great things to say about his wife and daughters so gotta love that now the writer of this episode it's not actually credited to him it's credited to a pseudonym um, from Colonel Kurtz from Apocalypse Now so the writer's real name John Milius I want to say that looks... Milius? All right, I'm not pronouncing that right. I do apologize. He went to USC film school, so he knew a lot of the big players like George Lucas. And he has written on a lot of very popular things. Certain movies you might know, like Apocalypse Now, Dirty Harry, wrote and directed Red Dawn in Conan the Barbarian. So I think that this episode could have been exponentially better i think there was definitely something behind the scenes i've i I heard allusions to something going on behind the scenes but yeah there it definitely could have been better but you know what to be fair it was like very cheesy and fun it was like a b movie so this is my complaint the last two movies i've seen in theaters were too bad to enjoy bottoms and expendables four when i'm saying they were too bad to enjoy. There's so bad it's good. Like, I enjoyed this episode because it was fun, very cheesy. But, like, when a movie's trying to be good and it's not, like, yeah, so the only movies I've seen recently have not been enjoyable, not even in a bad way, like, not even in a good B slasher movie. So this was actually better than I expected, and I think I really tried to look at the positive And what I liked about this episode and cinematography and the way it was shot was definitely number one. Writing, I think they had some good bones in it. You had some good wide liners and Reb did seem like a psychopath Uh, and he was quite hunky to boot. And you want to know a cute little fun fact? John Milius, the writer, is currently married to the woman who played Victoria. Elan, what's her name? Oberlin is her last name. No, it's not. I'm so sorry. What is it? What is it? What is it? Her name is Elan Oberin. Yep. She played Victoria, and that is his current wife to this day. So I thought that was 
Very cute. He also created the series Rome, which I remember I saw like bits and pieces of because I think I was like just getting into college and, you know, kind of like fit the bill with guy violence and gore and hunks. So very interesting man. And then one of the other goons is another athlete turn actor. Uh, Lasco was the big one. He's the one at the door when he's like, um, when the guy asks if it's a joke that there's a delivery for Salazar, he's like, yeah, on you. That's John Matuzak. I want to say possibly Hungarian, possibly Polish. I'm trying to figure out. Uh, Slavs always like to decipher other last names that could also be Slavic or possibly Central European. So that's my little annoying habit. But with that, let's wrap up this episode. Let's pick our quote of the week. I don't swim in dirty water. Man, what a way to end this episode of Vice and Easy. Just want to thank you all for listening, for liking, for subscribing, for telling your friends. If you'd like to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, that is super helpful and it helps other people find the podcast as well. Thank you as always for joining me. You can like and subscribe to me on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can subscribe as well. And you can follow me on all things social at Vice and Easy Podcast. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next week for another episode, Breaking Down Miami Vice. Hey, man, Miami Vice is number one new show.